Good morning. <clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Let's turn that down a bit. Well, today, first frosty morning. <clears throat> well, I say I had a lot, a bit of a, had an attempt at a frost. Not really much of a try. Half a millimeter on the windscreen, that's all. And uh, now, <clears throat> quiz. What do you think I'm running, early or late? Early or late? Yeah, yeah, you guessed it. I've got nine minutes to get to work. That's a 20 minute drive. There's no way that's gonna work, is it? No way. Not even in my trusty Peugeot partner rocket. So anyway, how are you? <coughs> yeah? I hope you're well. It's uh, been a busy week for me this week. I had a good day yesterday, sort of lots of new patients, financially quite good. Had a weird, a patient came in who, this is this patient who uh, went to see two uh, on NHS dentist and couldn't get on the list and had two courses of antibiotics and was told to go somewhere to have the tooth taken out when all it needed was a root treatment. <clears throat> so we sort of routinely ring these patients up after a day or two just to check that everything is getting better. I mean, we know it is, we know it is. We don't have to ask because we know what we're doing. But uh, it's just like, uh, it's a courtesy call really just to remind them how brilliant we are. And you know, just to, you know, just to give them a chance to say, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, a, it's getting better. Every day is a lot better. And thank you so much. Because we reinforce in their mind the fact that uh, as soon as they came to see us, their life went into reverse. Things stopped getting worse. Everything started getting better. So, <clears throat> anyway, I uh, asked my receptionist to uh, give her a ring and just uh, see how she's getting on. And... Uh, she said, oh, don't worry, her partner's coming in mid-morning, we'll ask him. So sure enough, he confirms that everything's getting better, everyone's really happy, etc. <laughs> but he told me the weirdest story about how she'd, uh, she'd been flown to Africa to marry some African prince. And, um, <clears throat> and when she got there, she found out he was gay. So she refused to marry him. So the king ordered her to be taken out on the plains and basically beaten to death and left for dead for the lions. But then she was discovered by someone else who took her back and got her, nursed her back to health, etc., etc. And um, but then she couldn't prove who she was because she had no documents. So the foreign office wouldn't let her in. They wouldn't believe that she was a British citizen, which she was. And then um, eventually she had, through some extremely tenuous connection <clears throat> with the royal family, managed to get in touch with Princess Diana. And Princess Diana <coughs> arranged to, uh, for her to be repatriated. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. It's uh, unbelievable, the, uh, some of these patients' stories, you know. In fact, that's when I wasn't working as a dentist, that was what I missed. That's what I missed the most. You know, the uh, having a, like, a 20 minute discussion with someone who's in the police firearms response squad as to who would win in a battle. Someone, uh, like, someone who plays Call of Duty or the police. <laughs> and he's like, oh, the police would win, the police would win. And I'm like, mm. Oh, there's a sure now. I don't know if you know that there's a whole generation that's been brought up on first-person shooters and probably knows slightly more about angles of fire and uh, and uh, uh, sharp reactions, you know, than uh, than a lot of uh, policemen do. Simulations are there's a clamour for simulations to be realistic. 
which means basically if you buy a train sim uh, and uh, you buy the Javelin, the 395 Javelin train, which is HS1 that goes from Faversham to uh, St Pancras, uh, the controls are all the same. So if you can start one up in a train sim, you could probably start one up in real life. And in the flight sims, uh, if you can start uh, a plane, an airliner up in in uh, a flight sim, then again you can certainly start one up in real life. Um, it's a little known fact that planes don't have ignition keys. <laughs> they don't. They should do. <laughs> <coughs> but they don't. You just climb in and you have to press a large number of switches in the correct order but if you know how to what order and what switches then you've got yourself a plane. I don't know about trains, I think trains do have keys. I think probably train drivers are given keys. I hope they do. They're not simulated in the, uh, in the uh, train sim so maybe that they're not. Anyway, yeah, so still getting quite a few uh, implant inquiries. I've had my sort of contact letter from Dentali and Implantium, whoever they are, and saying that they're offering to sell me 15 implants, and uh, which I have to use up in a year, so I dare say I could get through 15 implants in a year. And then they give you like a free placement pack prosthetic pack and a, I don't know, two packs anyway, two, two kits. So, so that's all you need, you know, plus a few bits of things like the, uh, some bone. Don't think I'll need any bone. I'm not thinking of um, restoring any bone just yet. So I'll have to order some in. This uh, Pixel 2 is doing working well. The, uh, it's got a few little niggles, like the screen extends right to the edge, which is a bit of a pain. I know it's the, it's the trend, isn't it, to have like maximum screen on it, but it's uh, it does mean if you hold it in your hand, so supposing you've got it gripped in your hand like that, then this, this bit of your hand can sometimes creep around the edge of the phone and touch the screen. So all of a sudden weird things start going on with the screen that you're not quite sure what, what's happened but it's because you've touched the screen. So, and that's a bit annoying, so I'm, you know, I'm a bit, I don't like these bezel-less phones. Especially when the processors are so fast and the screens are so, so sort of receptive to touch, they're so... Um, they're alright when you're in an office or if you're... Um, you know, just come out of the shower or something. But if you've got very dry fingers, which I think a lot of you know, sort of older people do have quite dry skin on your fingers, because we're working, aren't we? We're the working class, right? So we get hard skin on our fingers. It's because in contact with things, because we we touch things and pick them up and move them around. Not like the younger generation who have just got these sort of alien pink fleshy fingers just for touching stuff, pressing and sliding. Anyway, if you've got a proper finger, then uh, sometimes the screen can be a bit unresponsive because there's no electrical conductivity there, which is a bit of a pain. Also, the sound on this is not brilliant. It's not brilliant. If you look at the sound wave, which I obviously do when I when I sort of put this up on YouTube, my the sound that you're getting is not anywhere near the potential sound. You know, the the waveform is. It's not as, as up and down as it could be. Amplitude is the word, I think amplitude. Because the amplitude is not, you know, it needs to be boosted, it needs to be normalized. So, well, I think that's possibly just because, you know, they, they think it might get in a, a lot of loud sounds, and so it's sort of toned, toned down a bit. We need, we need to boost the input, free input, uh, we need to boost the input. across the dipoles. So yeah, dentally, what's happening? So locally, we're getting uh, patients now from the NHS who can't get an appointment until next September. 
and I thought April was uh, was pretty poor because April was you know that's the start of the financial year isn't it so you sort of almost expect the NHS not to uh, accept anybody until they've got some more cash in because they're so cash strapped but now we've got to the situation where they probably got everyone who's on a waiting list and for April and now they're not taking they realize they've got more patients than they can take on in April so they're now um, telling people that it's um, September weird weird situation you want to know I mean there are two reasons for this right one is uh, that there's a failure of the, the governance failure that I keep going on about which is where the the way that we make decisions you know relying on 600 idiots that are you know are not 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 really a meritocracy is it the house of lords it's just it's always as it as always has been just based on the mob swaying the mob to vote for you and when you get in trying to screw your research assistants and then uh, <coughs> they delegate all the decision making to the select committees who are by and large you know only read the papers on the morning of the meeting and are not really very specialist in their subject so uh, you know and you might find one person on there who knows something about it and then the rest of them just uh, take their lead from that person and then they have these uh, select committee inquiries where they're given all the uh, the evidence that they need uh, and then they then uh, completely misinterpret it and ignore it and uh, and uh, put out a report which the Department of Health then ignores knowing that the, that's it, that's their work done for another four or five years until the next select committee inquiry in the meantime everyone's losing their teeth aren't they <clears throat> that's one that's one thing I mean that's the major thing and then the other thing was that for years we had an incompetent nincompoop of a chief dental officer called Barry Cockroft who was <clears throat> appointed on the basis that um, the, the Secretary of State at the time was not at all interested in dentistry and didn't want to learn about it and thought that they could delegate uh, was effectively was the uh, uh, was uh, the governance function you know the the decision-making function to a member of the executive uh, who was really only supposed to be tasked with carrying out decisions not actually making them but they said no no you could you got to do it you might as well decide what you're gonna do and he did and he was an idiot so and that's how we've got to the point where we are today where you can't, you know, you, you can be in pain, you can be in severe pain, you can be have a severe infection, and uh, you can all you can get is courses of antibiotics, which is, you know, one at the same time, <laughs> at the same time as you're driving to the dental line emergency centre to pick up your antibiotics, you're listening to an article on the radio about uh, the overprescription of antibiotics and how uh, we're running out of antibiotics and. Uh, we should all stop prescribing antibiotics. <laughs> uh -huh. oh, I'm glad you're able to join me every morning as I try and make sense of this complete clusterfuck. I tell you, I, uh, it's like you, you do, you do have to sort of sit and think, think about it a bit, don't you? Just sort of think, yeah, okay, okay, that's black, that's white, and wait, you're like being tossed about on a storm and you just, like, you find a lighthouse or you find a rock and so you cling to it because it's the only solid thing. The only solid thing, really, is your own mental state, your, your, your job, you know, possibly your surgery, if you own a surgery, not if you're an associate, it's not your surgery. Uh, you have to just, you know, your family, your wife, for a few years, <laughs> for most of you, uh, and your children, because they'll always be your children. So um, you sort of turn inwards, you know, which is not good. Everyone, you have to solve everyone for themselves type mentality, which I don't think, you know, I know Mrs. Thatcher loved that. And uh, all the econo economists say that uh, there's no such thing as a group or mass action. It's simply the, the, the sort of the macro manifestation of a number of micro actions. Uh, but um, it's, life is, 
is confusing and uh, distressing and uncomfortable, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and it shouldn't be like that, you know. I mean, what's, we're not, we are not put on earth to suffer. We are not. We're put on earth to have a bit of fun. And that's, you know, like our slogan, make money, do good dentistry and have fun. That's, we, you have to do the fun bit. Talking of which, we're going to um, pantomime tonight. The technician who's next door, famous for playing outrageous dames and various other outrageous characters, anything outrageous, he'll play it. Uh, is uh, got the you know, got the old panto on. So it's a bit early for a panto. It's not even uh, December yet, but anyway. So we're looking forward to that. All the staff are going. <clears throat> we're pretty tight now as a bunch. The staff are, you know, we're like, you know, we're very. Uh, we decide what to do as a group, and we don't, you know, you don't get one of them saying, "Oh no, my husband won't let me go," or "No, I'm, you know, I'd rather not go to that." If you're trying to do things as a group, and uh, you're, um, and you have got dropouts like that, then you need to sort of have a look at the people who are dropping out and find work out why, because these things are not necessarily team building, although they are, you know, part of the enjoying. Uh, things together on a sort of a communal basis, social events, is, is team building as such, it sort of reinforces the team, but it, it doesn't force a team to come together. If your team is not coherent in the first place, enough to come along, then, uh, then you know, something's going wrong. Usually it's because the, uh, the you, <laughs> let me just go through a few common mistakes of team building, okay? One is that uh, you, you tend to do what the principal wants. In other words, the principal thinks it will be a great idea to go to Ascot races. And, uh, and he thinks he would really enjoy that. And so what happens is he organises it and then, you know, the rest of the staff decide that's too far and it's too, um, you know, it's too much trouble and, and really they don't, they're not into horse racing or gambling or anything. And, uh, now I'm not saying that they wouldn't have fun. They would have fun. They just decided they wouldn't have fun, so they decide not to go. Then the second thing is um, organising things during work hours, and this is an interesting one because you think that organising things during work hours would be would be a good idea. Um, the problem with that is that if you organise something during work hours, then you have to pay the staff and say this is th today this day we're not going to be doing dentistry we're going to be doing this you still come to work at, at the same time you still go home at the same time but during the day I've organized something different and they get paid um, and if you don't pay them you know it doesn't matter what a fantastic you can you can say we're gonna to fly to Paris and have dinner at the top of the Eiffel Tower right but if you then say to them I'm not going but but you know I'm gonna to have to tell you we're gonna to have to take it as a, a unpaid holiday they can say, oh, in, that in that case, I'm not coming. I'd rather have a day's pay than go and eat at the top of the Eiffel Tower. And even if you spent 10,000 pounds on it. So, so just be, just choose carefully how you're gonna do it, okay? If you, um, you can also choose things that are, some of the staff will object to. Like, I, uh, we, we had a day where we went um, quad bike a uh, quad bike day and um, it turned out that one of the receptionists unbeknown to me had a worm phobia and so when she got there and she realized that it was going to be in a field and not you know on the roads um, she just refused to get on the quad bike and then that of course puts a dampener on the whole day doesn't it because we're all thinking oh well we're having fun but she's not having fun she's just stuck in the cafe oh. What else? I mean, we're going in the evening, and so uh, again, you know, I mean, people can opt out. They don't have to spend their evenings with you, but they, if you choose something that they all like, and we do, they, I sort of let them agree on what they would like to do, and then I, I fit in with them, you know? So if they decide they want to get on a coach and see the Lion King in London, then it's, it's Muggins here who just has to fund it. It's as simple as that. Um, and if I, uh, you know, and if they decide that they want to go and see the, the Panto, 
which we all decide anyway we go every year then then that's fine you just have to fund it it's not you know that's your job fund things you know you should know that money oh 8.56 oh my god I'm 15 minutes late isn't it great when you go in have you ever gone in and said to the patient I'm sorry about the delay and they say no 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 I should apologise for being late and you go what you are late great fantastic I wish someone had told me then I wouldn't have needed to apologise for me being late and what do you mean you're late <laughs> oh I'm going to have to do it's a trouble easy see I start at quarter to nine right but if I change that and started at nine I thought the car had suddenly grown reversing beepers. It's not, I'm out of petrol. Alright, got a rush. See you tomorrow, bye.